today we'll finish up our, uh, our discussion of uh, Bode plots um, of, tran of frequency responses. And I, mean, I guess I'd start by just reviewing the, the two ba the fundamental things it's based on. Um, there are two, two important things. One is that the Bode plot of a product is the sum of the Bode plots. That's basically because it's the log magnitude and the phase are in fact the complex logarithm. That, that's what they are. So what that says is that whenever you have a transfer function or a frequency response and you can factor it, if you can figure out the Bode plots of each of the terms, you can then assemble everything just by adding and you're going to get the Bode plot of the whole thing. Similarly, if you're going the other direction, if you actually see a Bode plot of something or a frequency response and you want to decompose it, for example, into a rational function with poles and zeros, uh, you have to look for features and then yank them out and so on. Okay, so that, that's part one. Part two, um, the, other, the other important thing on which this is based is the following graphical interpretation, which is pretty simple. If you have a rational transfer function, you put the zeros and poles in a normal pole zero plot, and what you do is you take a point on the imaginary axis, S equals J omega, and to calculate the magnitude of the frequency response there, you calculate the distance to every pole, and you take the product, and you put that in the denominator. And you take the distance to every zero, and you put that in the numerator. Okay? So for example, a pole zero pair like this contributes a magnitude here at this, at this frequency, which is the ratio of the distance between this point and this pole and this point and this zero. Okay, so that's the effect of a pole zero pair, for example, is a ratio of distances. And angles are exactly the same. You calculate the angles of all of these arrows which point from the polar zero to the point on the imaginary axis. All the angles for poles have a negative number in front of them, and all the angles for zeros have a positive number in front of them. Why? Because the zeros are in the numerator and the uh, poles are in the denominator. So that's the, uh, that's the idea. And in fact, these, these, two, these are the basic properties. If you understand these two basic properties, then everything else can be worked out uh, when, when you need to. Okay, so this allows us to look at, uh, at various things. There, there's a few things you should know, like uh, what, is the, what is the Bode plot of something like a real pole or a real zero uh, look like? Um, and I'll explain this because this is just something very, very good to know. Here's a, uh, a transfer function with a single uh, pole at uh, S equals P. Um, if P is negative here, then this represents a stable pole. Um, if P is positive, it's an unstable pole. In other words, the impulse response of this is either, if P is negative, a, a, if P is negative this is a decaying exponential, and if it's positive, it's a, it's a growing one. Now, the magnitude of this, you can simply work it out. Well, it's easy because P is real here. Um, there was a mistake here last time. This should have been 1 over square root omega squared plus P squared. And if you take the log of that and plot it, you get something that looks like this. Now this is a Bode plot. In other words, the, uh, these increments here, that's a decade, a factor of 10 in frequency. So it's important to understand that 1 over square root omega squared plus p squared does not look even remotely like this. That's a function that looks like this, kind of goes like that. Okay? But if you put it on a log-log plot, it looks like this. And here, at least when you're looking over a broad enough band of frequencies, when people look at this, the first obvious thing is that this thing is almost piecewise linear. Okay, so when you have a real pole, it's a horribly nonlinear function, right? It's log, it's, it's 20 log 1 over, log 10, 1 over square root omega squared plus p squared. But when you plot it, it looks like that. And it's a remarkable fact that it looks almost piecewise linear. It looks like that. And so people refer to this sometimes as the straight line approximation of the Bode plot of a single pole. So like that. And in fact, uh, if, if you care about this or, or need to know, you, the maximum error occurs right at S equals P, right here. And there the maximum error is about three decibels. Another, and that's maximum error over this, uh, this straight line plot. Okay? So it looks like that. So basically, if you draw a straight line like this and then have it fall off, and then kind of sand the corner down, if you sand it down about three decibels, you have actually a very, very good picture of what a single pole um, magnitude looks like. It's actually quite interesting what this is. It, it really basically says that for a, a transfer function like that, 
really, it's, it's actually quite interesting what it says. It says, that it says that a very simplistic view of what this does explains it. For frequencies below this frequency P, it says this thing does nothing. That's a good, that's a good approximation to it, that what comes in comes out. That's the approximation that this is just zero decibels out here. Okay? Above that frequency, it's going down linearly, approximately, and that basically says it's an integrator. So one way to, to think of this is, in very simplistic view, it's the, sa it's the same as saying it's a box that for frequencies less than P does nothing, and above P acts like an integrator. In particular, when you put in frequencies above P into an integrator, they, they, they get smaller and smaller because an integrator, of course, when you put in a really fast wiggling signal, doesn't have a lot of output because so, it's, it's integrating something that's oscillating fast. So that's a simplistic view. This is not unlike the simplistic view in 101 of these, uh, these old rules about, you know, current takes the path of least resistance or something like that, which is this, it's a stupid way of saying that basically if you have R1 parallel R2, then you know, if you just, if you just want to have a rough idea of what R1 parallel R2 is, it's very simple. It's basically R1 if R1 is a whole lot less than R2. Uh, so it's basically it's the minimum of the two, except right when they're about the same. When they're about the same and you say it's the minimum, you're off, in fact, again, by the same amount, which is square root two. So this is not unlike that. Okay, now the phase also looks, uh, looks like this. The interesting thing about the phase is here the transition the transition between the area where there's appreciable error in the straight line approximation is maybe a decade of frequency. So if you draw it on a big enough plot, you hardly get anything. Now, an interesting, now good rule of thumb for the phase is that the phase is basically zero. Here's, there's many different ways to do this. Um, then it kind of goes like that. So that's, that's, a, that's a reasonable straight line approximation of the phase. And a good rule of thumb is that the basically when you have a, a, first, a single pole, um, What's happening is this, that the phase actually has an effect over a far broader range. It makes the transition over a far broader range than the magnitude. In fact, a good rule of thumb is two decades. So, so the, another, another way to say it is if you have a real pole and you want to know how low in frequency do you have to go, what happens right at the real pole? You're getting 45 degrees of phase shift. If you go back a decade below your pole, you're getting that, that's about where it becomes negligible. And a decade above, that's where it's bottomed out at the full 90 degrees. Now, again, you can do this graphically very easily. Graphically, the picture is this. You've got a pole. I'll put it here. That's fine. Um, your frequency is moving along here. This is a linear axis, and, this, and the Bode plot's on a log axis, so that's one of the, the, the differences here. If, if the frequency is really small, that's down here, up to one-tenth of the pole. That's over here. It basically says the phase is, is zip, which is pretty accurate here. Then, right when it's equal to the pole in magnitude, it's 45 degrees, and I think you can see that here. Okay? Then, if you go to 10 times more, it means that the plot, you're, you're 10 times higher than this, and the angle here is obviously you know, about 85 or 90 degrees. So you, I think you can sort of see, see this. Um, Okay, so that's the, that's the picture. Um, here, there's all sorts of other, well, we'll, we'll get to that later. But, uh, so this is the, the approximate straight line approximation. It is, of course, it used to be, let's say 15, 20 years ago, important to actually know a lot about straight line approximations and, and be able to do this because, in fact, let's say, I don't, I don't know, let's be generous and make it 25 years ago, um, your, your basically your, the method of uh, plotting Bode plots, <clears throat> that was you. You did it. They had special paper and all sorts of weird stuff like that. Um, it's trivial now, uh, so it's not that important to know all the details. In fact, it's irrelevant. The important part is to actually understand all the ideas here about what, what this works. So actually understanding this is very important. Being able to sort of do straight line approximation plots is not, not particularly relevant. OK. Now here there's an interesting difference um, between a stable pole and an unstable pole. If you have 1 over s plus 1, that's a pole at minus 1. It's this stable pole. And the magnitude looks like this, and the phase shifts down like that. Okay? And you can actually work that out very carefully by imagining where a pole is and looking at this pole 0 plot and so on. Now, if you have uh, an unstable pole, let's see what the difference is. The magnitude is identical. The phase shifts up. And actually, it's extremely important to understand this. 
So here's the difference. Here is a stable pole, and here's a frequency. Here's an unstable pole, and here's the frequency. Now, if you want to find the magnitude, right, you, you actually take the distance between your j omega point and your pole. What's the distance between this and this? It's the same. So in fact, this generalizes. For example, here's a transfer function. Doesn't really matter, right? So the point is, in a transfer function, I can take any pole or any zero, and I can flip it from stable to unstable. And what effect will it have on the magnitude of a transfer of a frequency response? Absolutely none. It will not change the magnitude in any way because what you're doing is you're just calculating a distance. And for example, the effect of this zero is to multiply the frequency response by this distance. The effect of this zero over here is to multiply by that distance. It's identical. Now, this, this, should, this should set up a little warning flag for you, which is very important. You know that whether or not a pole, for example, is in the left or right half plane makes all the difference in the world to the actual dynamical system, right? Like whether the thing is, going, is, is actually growing with time or shrinking and all that kind of stuff. But for a Bode magnitude plot, it makes no difference whatsoever. On the other hand, if you switch a pole or zero from sort of stable to unstable, from left half plane to right half plane, um, does it affect the phase? There it affects it very, very much, right? It affects two things, actually, the sign of the phase and, and, and also a usually 180 degree offset. So these are the two things that, that happen. So for example, here, the phase is rising. Okay? And the reason for that is very simple. Again, you kind of just make your picture. Uh, the picture for that is this. The pole is now here. And as you go up here, you start with a phase of what? 180. It's a pole, so you subtract. So it's minus 180 is the phase for low frequencies. As you increase, like at this point, the phase is minus 135, right? As you keep going, when you get way, way, way up this way, the phase eventually tops out at about minus 90, OK? And, and sure enough, that's exactly what this, this shows you, OK? Everyone get that? This is. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's important to be able to figure out these, uh, these subtleties and stuff like that. OK. Um, now, if you have a real 0, it turns out that the Bode plot is, abs is simply, again, because these are logs, it's upside down. So for example, here's a term, which is a, a 0 at s equals minus 1. It's a 0 at s equals minus 1. Well, the Bode plot of 1 over s plus 1 and s plus 1 are, e are very simply related. The log magnitude are just, is negative of each other because it's 1 over it. And the f angle also is just negative. Because basically, inverses under a logarithm transformation become negative. It turns into negation, right? So that's exactly that's what happens. In inverses turn into negation. OK. So for example, a 0 now looks like basically something that's upside down from a pole. It, it's nothing, and then it grows. And the phase also does this. And in fact, again, you can give a beautiful simplistic interpretation of this. It basically says that a transfer function, which is 1 plus s, which, by the way, does what to a signal? What does that do to a signal? What's 1 plus s do to a signal? It, what's it mean? If I plug in a signal u, what comes out? What's s plus 1 times capital U of s? Yeah, it's a differentiate plus what? Yeah, plus itself. So if u comes in, what comes out is u plus u prime, right? You have to keep all the, remember, there's many ways you can think of a, of a transfer function now. You have to think about the impulse response, the step response, the, uh, the qualitative properties, like is it stable, and all that kind of, and yeah, you should be thinking about all these things simultaneously and making all these connections. That's, that's kind of the, the, the trick to, to all of this. Okay. So here the simplistic view is that this thing basically is the same as 1 for low frequencies. And for high frequencies, it looks like s. That's, so basically, it's a kind of a frequency sensitive differentiator. For low frequencies, it doesn't do anything. It's, it's 1. And for high frequencies, it turns into a differentiator. That's the simplistic view. OK. Probably the best way to, to uh, do these, um, to understand this stuff, is actually to fiddle around with just some examples to, to see to see how this, how this works. That's really the best way. 
Um, and again, things are different now because you don't need to memorize, you know, idiotic straight line approximations that you will find in all textbooks. You don't need to because anyone can plot the Bode plot immediately. The only real thing that you have to do is you have to understand Bode plots. That's the only thing you really have to do. So we'll do that by examples. So here's an example. It's a transfer function. In fact, this, this, one, it, this one exactly is very typical. You will see this transfer function in 113. You will see it in 214. And you'll see it in 314 if you haven't gotten wise by then and bailed out of EE. But <clears throat> anyway, um, so you'll see this a uh, bunch of places. Um, this exact transfer function, or one awfully close to it. And, the, and so let's get a, a, an idea of what does, what does the Bode plot look like. Well, we can actually talk about all sorts of things with this. For example, uh, what are the poles? Well, there's minus 10. That's minus 300, right? And that's minus 3,000, OK? What's the dominant pole? Minus 10, right? So there's a, there's a pole at minus 10, um, which corresponds to about what, uh, what, what does that mean about, about this, say, the step response of this thing? Just roughly, rough order of magnitude time. How long would the step response take to, to what, what would be the rise time of this amplifier? If you have a, you have a term, in, term in the impulse response that looks like e to the minus 10t, how long does it take before that's kind of gone? How many seconds? Half a second, yeah, OK. So, so we, uh, you should have a, f a good flavor for what this looks like, that the step response, whatever it is, it should be kind of gone in about half a second. And if it, in fact, if you, if you plot this, in fact, there, one of the re let me mention one of the reasons why this is so important. It's so easy, as you'll find in your next homework, to type a little thing into a computer and have the step response pop up in front of you and the impulse response and the Bode plot. Um, and a number of things can happen. First of all, the program can be completely wrong. That actually happens. But more than likely, you just made a stupid mistake. And so it's very important when you see this to be able to, without even thinking, the first thing you should do when you look at that is say, well, it's stable. Uh, the DC gain is 10 to the 4. That's 80 decibels. Uh, the dominant pole is at minus 10. Step response should be pretty much over in about half a second. Okay? And then what happens is when that's painted on your screen or your monitor, it better look something like that. Because okay? otherwise you'll be very, you'll, I promise you'll be in big trouble. You'll mistype something. And uh, that'll be the end of that. How did you get half a second for the decay time? Well, there's an e to the mi this is a pole at 10 here. And so you get an e to the minus 10t term. OK? So one simple rule of thumb says, how long does it take for an exponential to be totally gone? Five time constants. So I took 5 times 0.1 seconds as half a second. I meant for it to be like totally, total history. I could have I taken 200 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, and that would be, that'd be the time where a good, you know, it'd be at, up at 67% or something like that. Okay. okay. All right, so let's look now at the frequency response of this, this thing. Uh, the DC gain is 80 decibels. You get that by plugging in S equals um, 0 here, and you get 10 to the 4 on top. The poles are at minus 10, minus 300, minus 3,000. Okay. So, um, in fact, this shows you exactly why it is that you use Bode plots. Because what, the way someone would describe this is they would say that the dynamics of this system are widely spread out in time. Okay? Notice that this is, this, is, this is a real transfer function now. This is not like the little the toys that we play with where you have poles at 1 and 2. We have poles at 1 and 2 and minus 3 and minus 4 so that when you multiply out the polynomials, the coefficients are all things like you know, s squared plus 3s plus 1. Okay? Sometimes things look like that, but this is far more common. And what this really says is it says that this op amp here, that's what this is, right? That several things are happening. One is happening on a time scale of 100 milliseconds. One is happening on a time scale far faster, which is milliseconds. And another is happening in the microsecond range. Okay? And in fact, that's exactly correct. Once you actually look inside and know what an op amp is and know all the details, you'll even understand exactly what all of those things are. And you'll, you'll point to something and you'll say, that's taking place on a seconds or milliseconds basis. That's, that's microseconds and so on. OK, but it's spread out. And as you can see, a linear frequency plot would do no good here because things are so spread out. That, so this is actually why we have 
Bode plots or logarith logarithmic frequency axis. Okay, so here is the, the Bode plot. Um, again, this, this just pops out. This is, uh, this is about you know, eight ASCII characters, you get carriage return, and this just comes up. Okay, so the question is, is it right? And do you understand it? These are the main questions. Like, did I type something in wrong? Let's, let's find out. I don't know, maybe I did. We can, we can check. So let's first figure out what it should look like. Well, let, let's look at different terms. You have a 10 to the 4 term, right? And then I have a 1 over 1 plus s over 10, and a 1 over 1 plus s over 300. And then you get the, the idea. OK, so this is what you have. Let's do the Bode plot of each one separately. What does the Bode plot of 10 to the 4 look like? Just the gain 10 to the 4. What's the magnitude of that? It's just, it's 80. So it's just a straight line all the way across. What's the phase? Zero. What if I had a minus sign in front of this? What would the phase be? Of my, what's the phase of the gain minus 10 to the 4? What if, my, it's what? 180? Or I heard 180 and minus 180, which is correct. They're, they're exactly the same, both. Both are correct. So you can say minus 180 or plus 180, and you're right. right? And you get the same thing. OK, that's easy. OK, let's, let's make the Bode plot of this guy. 1 over 1 plus s over 10. Well, that's got a pole at minus 10. So guess what? We just go back over here, a couple of things, and we steal. Or I'll just, I'll just do the straight line one right now. That's easy enough. So we take omega equals 10, and the Bode plot of this guy looks like this, and then it, and then it rolls down. When s is small, this is starts at 0 decibels, and then it rolls down like that. And if you want, you can sort of just sand this down a few decibels over here if you want to get the picture. That's it. That's the Bode plot of this, magnitude plot. That's contributed by this term. OK? This term is the same thing, only it goes out to 300. So it goes way, way out here. Oh, sorry. Actually, it's also zero decimals. And then it, it, it rolls off like that, like that. In fact, now I'm going to have to change my scale because I've done this in a bad way. OK. Let me get it right this time. Here's 3,000. Here's 300. Here's, um, let's see, that's 30. OK? So. That would be a factor of 3. That's 10 would be right there, something like that. Sorry, am I doing it? No, this is wrong. That's right. Right, that's a decade. Yeah, I got it right. OK, so 100 is right smack in the middle, like that. Oh, except we have a 10. That's what we have. So it's over here. That's 10. OK, so what we have is this. We have something that comes up here at 10 and starts rolling off, right? We have another one that comes over to 300 starts rolling off. And we have another one that goes all the way to 3,000 and starts rolling off. OK? And by the way, what I'm sneaking in here is I'm sneaking in kind of the length, the, the, uh, the verbal descriptions that you hear on the street in describing Bode plots, right? which is not. Yeah. So, so you'd, people would talk about, well, this would come up to that frequency. And then above, they'd say, oh, above 300, it starts rolling off. And then you'd say, well, that other pole, that goes out to 3,000, 3, and it starts rolling off. OK? So to get the Bode plot, oh, and then finally, there's one more thing. There's this one. This is the plus 80 dB. OK, now we just add these four terms together, and we get the whole Bode magnitude plot. What does it look like? Well, below 10, it's basically plus 80 dB. At 10, at 10 radians per second, the thing starts rolling off at 6 dB per octave, or 20 decibels per decade. Right? That's this slope. OK, starts rolling off like that down to some frequency. The next time it hits 3K, and now I'm adding this plus that. It, now it starts rolling off at a sharper, at double the slope. Everybody got that? Because I'm adding these two things, each of which are rolling off. So this thing is now going down with twice the slope. And it goes down until you hit 3,000. And at 3,000, it goes down with three times the slope. OK? So here the, here's the way someone would explain it, just very, very quickly over the telephone or something like that. You'd say. Someone says, well, what's the frequency response look like? And you say, well, it's, uh, it's flat up to uh, 10 radians per second. Actually, it's a big lie. They would actually, depending on the subfield, you use hertz. So if, you use, if you're actually doing amplifier design, you'd use hertz. So you'd say, well, up to 10, it's flat. Above 10, it rolls off 6 decibels per octave. That until 300, it hits another pole. Then it rolls off at eight, 12 decibels per octave. That, that continues till it hits 3K. 
and a 3K, there's a third pole, and it rolls off above that at 18 decimals per octave. So that's the way someone would say it, just like that. You know? Or 60 decimals per decade, or however. And then we better look over here and make sure that that's true. And in fact, that is quite true. That's exactly what happens. It's kind of flat up to 10. Um, the next thing it hits is at 300, which is right here. And the thing here is it's kind of all smooth, smooth together. But in fact, if you kind of plot this slope and then plot, let's see, where's 3,000? There's 3,000. And you plot that slope and then you plot that slope, you know, it's actually reasonably consistent with the fact that that's minus 6 dB per octave, that's minus 12, and that's minus uh, 18. Okay? And the phase we can also uh, work out. Um, we can also work out in, in a very, very similar way. We just add up these three things. Phase transitions occur over a much wider bandwidth, basically over plus minus a decade. That's a factor of 100 in frequency. And so what happens then is the effects get smeared together. And that's it. OK, so that, when you put, paste that all together, you get this. 25 years ago, you would have had to have been responsible to actually construct this plot. That's totally irrelevant and useless now. The only thing you have to do with this plot is understand it, verify it, and make sure it's right. For example, let me ask you a question just to see if you do, if you do get it. Suppose I propose a change in this amplifier. And suppose the change is the following. Is that this, three, this pole at minus 300 is actually going to be a pole at minus 500. And I would like to know, what, how does it affect the Bode magnitude plot? That's the question. It's a proposed change in the amplifier. I'm going to switch one transistor for another. And I just want to know. That's what's going to happen to the pole. What's going to happen? This you do have to know now. Of course, you can just type into your computer minus 500 and hit Bode carriage return. And it will paint there. But the point is, this is a simplified question. What if I said, oh, I'll let you, I'll let you do it you know, any of uh, four or 500 values, what would we do? So anyway, what's going to happen? What, what, what'll happen then? It's a rough idea to the magnitude. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, it, it's just, it's S over 500. I meant to say that. Sorry. It, I'm just going to change the three to a five. That's all I'm going to do. So you would say I'm going to push that second pole out. I'm going to make it higher frequency. Well, that means over here on this plot, instead of this thing, here, we're going to have that. And what's the effect going to be? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit higher, but only above about 300. So above 300 hertz, the gain is going to be, the magnitude is going to be a couple of decimals higher. We could work out exactly. It's about two and a half decimals. Okay, so that's the effect. So the effect will be that instead of this plot, it would look like this. We'd go to 300. It would look like that. This is kind of a plot with a, a lot of decimals here, right? So you don't really see the details. But it would look like that. That's what it would look like. What effect would it have over here? Practically nothing, almost nothing, right? It would have some, some minor effect. It would be in the fifth digit or something like that. But for all practical purposes, it wouldn't have any effect at all. OK, let's look at the next example. Um, next example is uh, oh, it's an interesting one. It's s minus 1. S minus 3, uh, and the poles are, are minus 1 and, and minus 3. So here's the pole 0 diagram down here. Here's the pole 0 diagram. And the first thing you notice about it is some beautiful symmetry. And so the first thing is let's, let's knock off the, the Bode magnitude plot, which is actually really fun, really easy. You, you put a point here, and you calculate the distance to each pole, and you take the product. Now you calculate the distance to each 0, and you, and you take the product. And then you, you divide this number by that number. But what do you see here? Well, it's 1. I mean, this distance is equal to that distance because of this uh, symmetry here. This distance equals that distance. This distance appears in the numerator, that in the denominator. This is in the numerator. That's in the denominator. So the magnitude of this thing is 1, period. It's a very interesting Bode plot. In fact, it's very much like the transfer function 1. And in fact, from a Bode magnitude plot, you can't distinguish it. This looks like 1. Any, if you put a, any sinusoid into this thing, what will come out is a sinusoid with exactly the same amplitude. Okay. Now, what's different? Let's find out what's different. What's different is the phase. 
And this is actually quite interesting. So the phase is this. If you work out what the phase is, you get a very, very different picture. And before we see what it looks like, let's actually figure out qualitatively what it's going to do. And I, I think I'll just do it for uh, two poles, or, or one pole and one zero. So here's a zero. Here's a pole. Let's start here. And so here my that, that's a phase angle. Let's, let's figure out what's the phase here. Well, this is 180 degrees here. And the angle from the pole is what? Zero. So I take 180 minus zero. So I start at 180 degrees about there. Okay. Now as I, as I move up this axis, what happens? For example, what is it here? Well, this was 180 and it's getting smaller. Right? So now it's maybe 150 at this point. And this one is growing. So this is maybe 30. In fact, by the symmetry here, whatever, if this is 150, that's got to be 30. So the phase there is now 150. That's in the, and then you subtract 30. And what do you get? It's like 120. Right? What happens when I'm at this critical point when this is now 135 and this thing is 45? What's the phase at this point? Yeah, let's see. Well, let's see. 135, yep, 90. Okay? And then what happens when you get way, 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 way high frequency up here? Then what is this angle is about what? It's about 90. And this angle is about what? 90. And so what's the phase way, way up here? Zero. About zero. Okay. So this, this pole zero symmetric pair like this, it, this is, by the way, this is, vi this is very important to do because this is, this is what will get it all, this is how you'll get it all right. Okay? Um, what it says is that the phase should start at 180, right? Then it should decrease. That's what, that's what we're tracing here. And then asymptotically it should be zero. So it should, start, it should switch from 180 down to zero. Okay? Now, if I add this, what happens now? I get the same thing, don't I? except on a different, it's stretched, it's on the same scale. So the phase contribution of this pair should do the following. It should start at 180 and then decrease down to 90, this pair. Sorry, zero. So altogether, the net phase should be, the net phase change should be 360 for two, two pairs balanced pole zeros. Everybody got that? Because this, this one changes 180, minus 180, decreases 180, this decreases 180, so the overall thing should decrease 360. Okay? And let's see if that is in fact what happens. You type Bode carriage return. And the first good news is that our, the Bode magnitude plot is in fact 1, it's 0 dB, right? And the phase, in fact, does exactly what we figured it should do. It starts at 0, it, it decreases and changes about, three, well, 360 degrees. There it is. Okay? So this is the, uh, this is the idea. Okay. So that's a very interesting uh, filter. It's called, this is, this such a system is called like a phase filter because the magnitude is just one. Just one. And the, the phase, however, does change. So this is, this is something that looks like that. <coughs> okay. So this is, um, this is just another example. Um, we'll do one more example and then we'll do something more fun. Actually, then I'll make, I'll make you do it, actually. We're going to do some design. Actually, we're not. You are. Um, so here's another example. This example is typical uh, of uh, mechanical systems or electrical systems where inductance and capacitance dominate. So here's, um, it's basically, it's characteristic of highly resonant systems. So this would be very typical of an electromechanical system, for example. Okay. So here's, the, here's the, the transfer function. You can look at this. It's actually not relevant. Here are the poles. This is the best way to understand it. When you see this, you should immediately get a feel for what this is. Okay? You look at the poles. You say, well, there's a bunch of poles. They are complex, and they, are, they have small real part. That means that the impulse response of this looks like what? What does the impulse response of this system look like? Just qualitatively, what kind of terms does it have in it? It's got sinusoids that are growing, shrinking. They're shrinking slowly. Okay. Actually, are some of them growing or? Sh I mean, what's the sh growth and shrink rate? Are they all the same? Different? 
In this case, they're all the same. So what you would see is a bunch of sinusoids of different frequencies, all kind of shrinking at the same slow rate. And from the angles here, you'd, you'd see a fair number of oscillations before this thing damped out. So the Q, you would measure that by the Q or something of these poles, and you'd, you'd, you're going to see a bunch of oscillations here before things die down. OK, so this is, this is the, uh, the impulse. Res now you've got a picture for the impulse response, and you should be able to see that in, without even, you should see this, and that picture should form in your head. That's basically the way it should work. That when you see this, immediately you see that, you should see this, you see that, you should see that, and so on. Period. And the rate, the decay rates should be the same. OK, so there are the poles. Um, let's do the Bode plot. And this is actually really fun. Let's just get it qualitatively, what's going to happen. Well, here we are. Let's put a pole, pole, pole. Put the conjugates down here. Take a little bead. Pull the bead up the axis here. And let's just talk, let's just talk qualitatively about what happens. Okay. What happens as I pass this, if, when I get right near this pole, in terms of the magnitude? It gets really big. It should be really biggest right when I'm next to this pole. Because right there, the distance to that pole, remember what the magnitude is. The magnitude is 1 over the product of the distance to all the poles, right? So I calculate the distance to the poles, and I take the product. One of them, I have a product of numbers, and one of them is really small, and it's in the denominator. So we would expect that right as you sweep by a lightly damp pole, your magnitude should go way up. In fact, we can even figure out approximately at what frequency the maximum occurs. The maximum occurs kind of right when you're next to it like that. Turns out it's not exactly right there at all. It's just near there. The reason it's not exactly there is because all the other poles are having a contribution as well. But I mean, roughly speaking, it's near there. And in fact, the distance, which is, which is interesting, that's the real part, tells you how big the peak is. Because it's the real part, which is that distance, tells you how big the peak is. So now, when you see lightly damp poles from now on, it will mean two things. In the time domain, you should immediately visualize de slowly decaying sinusoid. In the frequency domain, you should immediately visualize a peak in a Bode plot, a peak in period. So when you see a lightly damp pole from now on, you will see a Bode plot. You will see a Bode plot with a little bump in it, like that. If you see one that's a really sharp bump, that's a that's that's a pole that's right near the axis. If it's kind of a big, softer bump, that's a pole. That's a le that's a, a more highly damped pole, and so that's the idea. Okay, what about phase? This is fun. Just take a point here, and what's the angle approximately from these these poles down here? They're all 90. And in fact, as I move this bead up here, what do the, the phase contributed by these three poles do? Nothing very interesting, because they start at, you know, I don't know, they start at 85, and then they go to 90. So they're not very interesting. Now what about these poles? If I'm below the three poles, I have arrows pointing down. These are all about minus, they're all about minus 90, right? Now what happens as I sweep by the first pole? OK? Well, you just have to imagine little things little, uh, little, little uh, vectors or arrows that point from each pole to the point on the axis. And they're tracking it. So these guys do something very boring. They kind of they move like that. That's these guys. The guy up top does something very boring, kind of starts like, like this and goes like that. But the one that you sweep by does something actually really interesting. The, in, that one goes like this. It starts this way. And as you sweep by it, this one goes like, whoosh, like that. And it does so over a pretty small range of frequencies. Okay? This is unlike a real polar zero. It goes rapidly by. And so in fact, what that says is that every time you pass a pole, you expect to see the following. A rapid decrease in phase by about 180 degrees. That's what you should see. Let's look at the Bode plot. There it is. And in fact, everything we just described, this is shown, by the way, on a pretty big axis. So. It's just to kind of show you what happens above and below. You would really plot this on a smaller axis, and then uh, it would be more spectacular. These bumps would really be, they'd really pop up. For example, these bumps pop up 30 decibels. That's not a small amount. That's a factor of 30 to 1, OK, or something like that. Yeah. There's a question? What determines how high the bumps, uh, the bumps go up? Well, that's precisely the real part, right? 
the, the peak, if you want to know, I mean, we can, see, we can answer all that. If you want to know how high is this bump here, this bump, it, you just go back to this model, which says it's the product of the distances. That's probably maximized, approximately, when you're at your sort of your closest approach to the pole, and that's right next to it. And then the distance to the pole is the real part. So in fact, the height of this bump controls the real part. So that's another thing. When you see, when you actually dispense with all this other stuff and make all the neural connections fit, when you look, you will look at a frequency response plot like this, and when you see little bumps, you will expect, if it's an acoustic system, it'll sound like that. Or if it's a mechanical system, or if you see a time domain plot, you'll expect to see things that, that's, that ring like that. That's what you'll expect. Okay? So this is sort of uh, the idea. Now, just to see if you get it, just for fun, let me ask you this. What if this second pole were actually unstable like that? What would the Bode magnitude plot look like now compared to what we have? How would it change? The Bode magnitude plot would not change in the slightest. In the slightest would not change. What would the Bode phase plot do now? This is much more interesting. What happens now? What, what happens as you zoom by this? Well, before, if, if, it's a, if it's a stable pole, your phase, you're sort of pointing down. I, I can't read this anymore. Here's your stable pole. As you zoom by, you start down here. This thing starts at about minus 90. And as you sweep by it like that, this, this arrow goes up 180 degrees. It's a pole, so that becomes negative in the phase. right? So here, you have a rapid decrease in phase by 180 degrees as you, as you pass a stable pole. As you pass an unstable pole, here's an unstable pole. Here, the angle is uh, whatever. You can call it, uh, I guess, 270 minus whatever, 270 or something like that. As you sweep by it, it goes down to 90. Okay? So there, the phase was the opposite. Right? So in fact, when you sweep by an unstable pole, what you see is a rapid increase in phase. And so the Bode plot would look exactly like what I'm about to draw. Instead of going down 180 here, it would go up like that. And then this would be the same. And it would look like that. Oops, 180. There. OK? So that's ex this is exactly what it would look like if that middle pole were flipped to be, were flipped to be unstable. OK? Everybody got that? So this is the type of stuff you, you have to know. You don't have to know all these horrible uh, details about making these plots and things like that. Although, of course, this is just a plot of a function, which you know quite explicitly. So you know, if worse comes to worse, you can just whip out your calculator and start typing in a couple of values and complex magnitudes and log 10, and, you'll start, and you can plot points down if you get confused. OK, so that was uh, our last example. And I'm gonna, now I'm going to get you guys to do something. Uh, and this is, ah, this, is what you're, this, is what you're, this is what you and your, and, your, and your computer with MATLAB won't be able to do. We're going to do design. That's what we're going to do. So I'm going to show you an audio filter that I want. Actually, I don't care about the phase. Let me, sh let me show you the magnitude I want. I'm going to draw it down. Quite realistic. Let's see. Can you go down the pad, please? Here it is. Ready? I want the following. Below 100 hertz, I want it to roll off at minus 12 decibels per octave. OK? And above 10 kilohertz, I want it to roll off at minus 18 decibels per octave. OK? That's my audio filter. Why? Well, this is some application. And below 100 hertz, mostly you're getting wind noise and rumbling and stuff like that. And above uh, 10 kilohertz, there's some reason why I want it cut off. That's what I want. OK? What's the transfer function? What do you think? What are we, where do we start? How do we start? Oh, and you know what? Just to be sick, I want this to have a gain of 40 dB in the middle here. Okay. I want the transfer function now. 
What do you do? <laughs> would that mean that if it's negative 12 decibels, then I would have t uh, uh, double zero? I would have uh, yeah, well, zero twice? Yeah. So then it would okay. be S plus 100 squared over yeah, S so plus. Yeah, so let's, 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 let's try to figure it out. Let's go piece by piece, OK? So first, first of all, how do you get 40 dB? Let's start with that. How do you get 40 dB? Huh? Yeah, you just have a gain of, what's 40 decibels? 100, right? So you start, so, so let's, let's make it simple. Let's start with a gain of 100, OK? Let's plot, we're going to do synthesis here. Let's plot, what's the Bode plot of what we have right now, magnitude plot? Well, it looks like this is 40 dB, but then it's 40 dB for all frequencies. Yeah, not bad, OK? It's not a bad start. There's our transfer function, 100. OK, what's next? Let's do this one first for fun. Let's do that one. How would you make, what, should, what do we do to make it roll off? What would make this thing roll off? Do we need a pole, zero? What do we need? You need a pole, OK? These are, let's make these radians per second, although in fact these are hertz. But oh, let's convert it. I don't know. So what's 10,000 radi uh, hertz in radians per second is what? You divide by 2 pi, so it's 1,400 radians per second. About. I'm just making that up, but that's about right. It's about 1,400 radians per second, let's say. That's 14 radians per second, I think. Is that right? Uh, did I do it the other way around? Yeah, sure I did. Sorry. Yeah, 10,000 hertz is, um, let's call it, um, yeah, 60. Let's just call it 60,000 radians per second, and we'll call this 600. OK? So where do I put the pole? I'm going to put a pole in this thing. Here, I'll draw a denominator. Yeah. So S minus uh, 600, All right? I could, now, this pole is at 600. It's an unstable pole. Okay. I could just as well, and in fact, if someone gives you this spec, this is fine. You can have 600 minus 600. It doesn't make any difference. We'll do it this way. We'll give it a, let's assume that there's an auxiliary specification saying that the filter we want to build, we want it to be stable. Okay? So it's S plus 600. Is a question? Oh, well, 60,000. Yeah, same, same thing. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> S plus 60,000. There you go. What does it look like now? Actually, there's a little bit of a detail here. <laughs> The problem is that the DC gain of 1 over S plus 60,000 is, in fact, 1 over 60,000. So if I'm going to do this, I have to write 60,000 up here. Everybody with me on that? Now I have something that hits 60,000 and starts rolling off, but it rolls off at minus uh, 6 dB per octave. Any, uh, any hints? What, what, tell me what to do. Squared. squared? OK, squared. Cubed. Cubed, yes. OK, there we go. Do it all, all at once. You cube it, and sure enough, it's now rolling off at minus 18 decibels per octave above 60,000. OK? Hey, we're getting there. OK. Now, uh, how do we do this? Any ideas? Wow. Anybody know how to do that? Or any ideas? We're getting there. We got, the, we got it. What we have is we have a. We would have what people would now call a low pass or a high cut filter. We have a high cut audio filter. It rolls off 18 decibels per octave above 10 kilohertz. Now we have to do a low cut. We have to add the low cut in. What do you think? Anybody got any suggestions? OK, where? At 600? Now, if you just add a zero somewhere, what's going to happen in the transfer function? Is this going to start rolling up? This does not look to me like a zero. In fact, this is very confusing. Yeah. What do you think? I'm going to give you. I'm going to start you off. Ready? I'm going to write down um, s squared here. That's two two zeros at the origin. Okay. That's something ramping up at 12 decibels per octave. Okay. It's ramping up. And I want it to level off. What do you add to something to make it level off? <coughs> hmm? Two poles, actually. So in fact, you put two poles here at s plus 100. We're actually out of time, so we're going to have to we're going to quit for now. See this? That's it. You can go off and build it now with some op amps and stuff like that. And that's it. Okay. 
We, we went kind of fast at the end, but that's it. That's sort of the idea. Okay, so you'll get, you'll get plenty of uh, chances to mess with this. Okay, so we'll quit here, and we'll continue uh, next time.